iHeartRadio Broadway, driven by Mercedes-Benz. The best or nothing. Chris, James, Adam, welcome to iHeartRadio Broadway. Thank you for having us. So we are here to talk about a very special event that is taking place on April 24th at 8 p.m. It is a global reunion of Rock of Ages, the all-star reunion concert. Um, Chris, how did this whole thing come to be and be put together? Well, uh, Matt Weaver, who was one of the original producers of Rock of Ages, uh, reached out. And I think at the when he first reached out that he wanted to do something, I think it was going to be just... Um, you know, just kind of a few people in LA singing some songs. It it really was, I think, not nearly as ambitious at first. And then we started talking and got excited about the notion that, it, you know, if we were going to do this, uh, why wouldn't we have all the people we love be a part of it? And that requires doing half of it in New York and half of it in LA. And so, yeah, it just kind of blew up from there. And what was nice is we didn't know who would want to participate, but almost everyone was able and willing and excited to participate. So we got like a lot of really fun alumni uh, to join the party. And James, when you were asked to be a part of this reunion, was it just a, a, a very simple, yes, I want to do this immediately? Immediately. Yeah, I mean, Chris, uh, we're all besties, but unfortunately Adam lives in New Jersey, but uh, Chris and I see each other all the time. His daughters. Mean unfortunately, I just mean unfortunately because we don't get to see you. New Jersey's been yeah. Tough, but... New Jersey was just ranked the forty-eighth least want to be lived in state. Which oh, like here we go with the New Jersey. Forty-eighth. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there are states like what's Dakota what's nine? What, what are the other? What are the other ones? I didn't what's look it up. Is? I just saw the headline. Just saw the headline. Oh, Ohio, Ohio, least Ohio. want to be lived in state. I'm so all sorry. Right. This derailed. It's fine. Um, I'll be okay. You, you, you knew it was about? gonna you knew it was gonna get derailed, so it's yeah. totally fine. I thought I, it yeah, would take I, said, a little I longer. said yes immediately. I mean, I was just so excited to be a part of it. I it, it was just gave me all of the feelings to, to be able to sort of revisit the material. And Adam, same question to you. Was it immediate yes to be a part of this reunion concert? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Chris had, had hinted that something might be coming, and uh, absolutely. I, not only have I missed uh, Broadway terribly, but this show in particular, um, it's been a while. So just to get a chance to revisit it and revisit the people and revisit the material and smoke and fog and lights and sound. I miss sound. <laughs> so yes. And Chris, I asked you this question when we were doing the press junket for the New World Stages uh, reboot of the show. Um, does it amaze you 12 years later, because April is the 12th year anniversary of Rock of Ages, that this show has been done all over the world, so many casts. I mean, there are people that have seen the show 500 times. Does it still amaze you that this show has this following? Oh my God, I wish I, wish I could just like with a straight face, like act like, the douche that's like yeah I totally I totally know and believe it um no of course not no it's stupid it's ridiculous there's no I mean it's, it's kind of what we get into with this concert too as we talk about the origin and you know it was just like it was a bar show in LA that um we did and we had a lot of fun with and we were able to sell out a bar every night but you know we it at every turn that we did the show it was like okay, well, that was fun. And even like, I mean, these guys will attest to it, like going up into opening night of Broadway, we were like almost convinced nobody liked us. Like it was really like, it was like, we weren't, we really didn't know. We knew we, it made us laugh and we know we were having a good time. We really loved what we were doing, but there never felt like we were on firm ground necessarily because it was pretty unconventional kind of show at the at the time um and so when people did respond positively and and kind of embraced what we embraced then then we were able to relax and then it just got ridiculous like and my favorite thing now is just seeing you know high schoolers in Stacy Jack's outfits and it just it's I remember when I was in Greece in high school it was like it's that same thing like you know, wearing your Danny Zuko costume, there's some kid out there wearing a Stacey Jacks costume. So yeah, it's awesome. 
And James, you are the original Stace, Broadway Stacey Jacks. So what has it meant to you to be a part of this show, the history of the show, but then to witness the fandom for the show to continue on for 12 years? Well, I, I uh, um, saw the show in LA in a bar with James Snyder and Laura Bell Bundy um, and uh, Dan Finnerty and Kyle Gass and, and loved it. And uh, when I got to be a part of it, it was sort of this kismet love story between Chris and I, because my buddy Patrick had done a movie with Chris. And so I, I had heard such great things about him. And um, Broadway's Patrick Wilson. Uh, yeah, Broadway's Patrick <laughs> Wilson. I always tell everybody like that, you know, it, it, doing a, uh, a Broadway show can be re repetitive and difficult and challenging on certain days, obviously. Sometimes you don't feel well, sometimes you're performing sick, sometimes you're just plain old tired. Uh, but every day when you stepped on stage for that show, it was an immediate like burst back from the audience that gave you that energy. It's like, and I, I mean, my much to my wife's uh, disappointment, sort of lived for the year that I was doing it or whatever as like a rocker. I go to take my kids to school with like, like messed up black nail polish and fake <laughs> naked women tattoos on my arm. And I kind of thought I was that person for a little while. And I, <laughs> I, it was, I, when else do you get to do something like that? And so to go and see it and to see it again when it moved and then to, you know, see all the different companies. And I was lucky enough to see the, the Bourbon Room uh, production that, that Matt just did, which I told Chris when I went, we went to opening night. I, I was like, I had my doubts about how the show would play in a small environment, you know, when you're right on top of it, because there were, you know, tables, you know, people were singing right on the tables, right in front right. of you. Uh, and it was so good. It was done so well. And it was, it, I, I was blown away by it. And so to see a bunch of people get to do it, other than maybe <coughs> Tom Cruise, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's awesome. <laughs> he, got to have a, he got to have a monkey, which was, you know, I don't know. <laughs> And I do feel like Rock of Ages changed the trajectory of Broadway audiences because it wasn't, and I don't mean this in a bad way, it wasn't a show that was like, oh, I'm going to Broadway and I'm seeing a highfalutin, you know, play by Mahler or whatever. It was a show for all audiences. It was for everyone to enjoy and to be in the theater together, whether you were pre-gaming before the theater or after the theater or even during the show, it was a show for all. And I think it really, Chris, it changed the way we look at Broadway audiences now. Well, I mean, it, it's funny because that was totally by design. I mean, I was a I was a theater nerd in a farm town in Michigan full of guys who loved Guns N' Roses and all this music, you know, Motley Crue, all that stuff. And they were my friends, but I was kind of this weird, you know, lone, you know, guy that liked, you know, Jerome Robbins Broadway. And I would be listening to that. Like, so I was just like kind of anomaly in this town. And so when this came, uh, by design, I wanted to write a show that was like an olive branch for those people who felt like they have no relationship to theater. And then hopefully at the same time, put enough in it that my theater friends are like, oh, I see what you're doing. I see that reverence. I get what this is. I get how, and then suddenly there's this kind of shared commonality and everyone's kind of enjoying an experience together that normally they would think wouldn't be theirs. And one of my favorite statistics about our show is I think the box office had told us, someone told us like, uh, it was like either 75, 65 or 75% of the audience every night had never been to a Broadway show. And, and I take great pride in that because then my, you know, hopefully they have enough fun or had enough fun at Rock of Ages that then they decided to go see Next to Normal and go see, you know, all the other great shows that were going on at the same time. And, you know, so maybe we were like an, an entree drug, a training wheels to Broadway. Well, well there's also, a little, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, James. What I was, I also want to just, cause I, every time this sort of question comes up, I, it, 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 I, I get, I get uh, uh, Chris Dorenzo lovey-dovey because, um, and my dad of all people who has seen several, many Broadway shows will talk about uh, how he really could, couldn't stand the music, but loved the show. And, and the reason why that happened is because 
um, he pulled off like the greatest magic trick ever. It was really easy for some people, especially in the theater community, I will not name names, but some of the highfalutin Broadway people were like, oh, Rock of Ages is just, and I'm like, no, it's not just. It's so Death good and so theater? smart. What? Death of American Theater? Death of, someone called it the Death of American <laughs> Theater. Some highfalutin. Some highfalutin, you know what we're talking but... about. She <laughs> went on, she went to, on to play a pop icon <laughs> in another show that might have actually been the Death of American Theater. <laughs> oh shit, here we go. Here we go. Oh, oh he's naming anyway, names, anyway, geez Louise. Anyway, anyway, he pulled <laughs> off this amazing magic trick because he's so, uh, well-versed in musical theater and theater and such a great writer, he was able to, to take something that could have been really benign and just a rock show and turn it into something that appealed to someone like my dad uh, in the same way that a next to normal or a phantom or whatever would. And I think that, that, that that's incredible. Also, we got so much crap in the beginning. Oh, it's just a place people could they're gonna let them drink in the seats. Well, now you can get like a triple Mai Tai at Wicked. Like everybody now is doing that. You, you know what I mean? It's like, they, there's like giant Glinda cups that like can be filled with four vodkas. I mean, it's like everybody now does it. And we got- And by the way, like, I would say like, when we did it, we, we like really tried to orchestrate when and how we would serve drinks. But to me, it always felt like part of like, like it, it was part of the show. Like, like for us, it was like the show should start the minute you get into the theater. I think a lot of like really great, you know, I, I see this with, with people like, like, I feel like Alex Timbers is really great at that too. Like starting the show, the minute you buy your ticket. And so like, that was kind of all like, like the drinking of it felt like a way to kind of bring the audience into this world. And so it always felt appropriate for this show I don't know that it's appropriate for every show, but maybe we opened some Pandora's box, sadly, that I don't know. Well, can I just say, so I never got to see the show on Broadway. I saw the New World Stages remount, what was that, a year ago at this point, a year and a half ago. Yeah. Uh, my first experience seeing the staged musical was in Vegas. I saw it at the Rio, oh, and it was like the most insane, wonderful experience you could possibly imagine. I was at a theater educator conference I was with 25 theater teachers and theater administrators, four bachelorette parties, five bachelor parties. And it was like the weirdest bringing together of so many different worlds while we're drinking these giant mugs of 47 alcohols combined together. And by the end, we were all friends with one another while we sat and watched a bachelorette party get thrown out of the show. I mean, it was That's just- beautiful. It was just the most amazing experience I have ever been in a theater, I have to say. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I love hearing that. That's funny. I don't want to overstate the point. I'm going to talk over. I don't want to, sorry. I don't want to overstate the point, but um, what, I'm going to overstate it anyway. What Chris did was he brought, um, people ended up coming, and I've never said this before. I'm going to try this out, Chris. You can put this on the t-shirt. They yeah. would come for the music and then come back for the story. For the show you know and that's what that was what's so unique about it, is that as you said they would bring those people in that would never come into a theater but then they wouldn't just be like that was an awesome concert they would come back and they would tell other people and they would come for the first time and then the theater people came for the story and then came back for the music so and i also and i also think there's a lovely reverse now with high schools being able to do it do the show is you're introducing these students to the music that we all grew up with so then it's this reverse situation that's happening that I find so beyond lovely. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it, it does, it very much reminds me of like, like my senior musical in high school was Greece. And that was, you know, 1990. And, you know, you think about like what that music was then, you know, like it was the same kind of experience where it was like, you're doing your own thing, you're doing theater, but you're also kind of like, sharing it with your parents in a weird, like weirdly, like my folks dug the music in Greece, obviously. And so like, yeah, it, 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 it there is something really great that you can kind of like uh, communicate with a younger crowd on your terms on music that you dig. Yeah. I want to get back to the concert because I want people to know that there are so many amazing people within this concert. You have Wesley Taylor, Lauren Molina, Frankie Grande, Kate Rockwell, Mitchell Jarvis. I mean, there's a whole slew, but there are some special guests. Um, I believe, is Dee Snider coming back to make an appearance during the concert? He, he's, he was in, 
either like Bali or Costa Rica. So we have him like via satellite <laughs> tuning in. Um, exactly yeah, like, and, uh, exactly like Stacy Jacks at the end of the. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any, um, any other any other special appearances we should know about? Well, we've got uh, Laura Bell Bundy, the original OG Sherry. We've got uh, I don't know if you said James Snyder, Broadway's Harry Potter was an original Drew. We've got Kyle Gass from Tenacious D, Dan Finnerty from the Dan Band. They were original people. Um, Constantine Maroulis is coming obviously. to make an appearance. <laughs> Yes, we've got we you can't do this without Connie. So uh, and he's going to be there, you know, when we're doing it live and we're going to have some a, a few numbers with him that are, are really fun. And what, one of the things we wanted to do with this show was um, not just do some of our favorite songs uh, from the Broadway show, but went into the archives of like songs that were once in the show and then got cut for whatever reason as the show morphed. So there's a few like deep cut tunes for uh for the the super fans you know and uh, you know before we go and i'm gonna plug the concert again april 24th 8 p.m on stellar you can buy your tickets now adam favorite memory from doing the show over the course of five years it just hit me when you said that i would say and not just because i'm staring at them but opening night and i know you guys already know what i'm going to say Opening night, the three of us who had gotten so close over the course, didn't know each other, you know, obviously prior, or we stood in James, James's dressing room, which is large, and um, the three of us just hugged and cried. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> yeah, Chris, yeah. Chris, you started crying because that's usually what happens. Yeah. So you started crying and the three of us before, you know, it was like out of a movie, right? <laughs> These three guys, he's in his nakedness with fake tattoos and I'm like wearing this wig and Chris is wearing some dope opening night outfit that he was going to stand in the lobby in and drink and cry or whatever he was going to do and we all just got together and we hugged and we cried and we loved each other and I don't think it gets better than that I could tell you some funny story on stage but that was that was the heart of the experience of Rock of Ages um, was that moment and James yeah. same question same question to you Okay, if you if you and you know y'all who are listening are gonna tune in uh, to the uh, to the live event, you may or may not hear that same story from me. <laughs> I don't know. But you told the but, story but, too. Uh, I told the story. Well, I, I don't you know kill the illusion. Um, but I do have, <laughs> before I tell my story, real quick, 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 because I, I saw somewhere that it was live at seven. Is it eight or seven? Because you said Hold eight. I'm looking now, uh, I just, Chris. Uh, well, I, I think it's eight five, Eastern. So eight, eight p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So five, it'll air in LA. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And then so, is it seven in Chicago? Wait, what's the thing? I what's it's Central? Seven Might be. I don't know. People can <laughs> do the math. Eight, eight Eastern. They'll figure it out. They'll buy it. They're, They're used to doing morning. it. They so base everything on New Jersey time anyway. Right. <laughs> so I'll quickly tell that my because he's right here. That other story that Adam just told, I I I as I said, I'm going to tell it, but. Um, so one night I'm on stage with Adam and I had probably done this show hun hundreds of times and, um, I, uh, started to say a line, I forget what it was. And I was like, I couldn't talk and he's looking at me and I, and then in my, I caught my ass, my ass part, my last part of the line, which was, you know what I'm saying? And he just looked at me and he goes, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I, why, cause I have a bit of anxiety issues in my life and I um, had a, a, a panic attack on the ride home on the train. Cause I thought, I don't know any of the lines in the play anymore. And I, uh, I had a day off in between, I believe that show and the next show. And it just started to fester. I'd be home and I'd be thinking about the, the lines that I'd said hundreds and hundreds of times and I couldn't remember the lyrics to songs that I grew up listening to that I sang in the show and I was like really freaking out get to the half hour 15 minutes five minutes now by now I'm like white knuckling right like I've done everything and the show starts and I'm down there and I'm there's a lot of crying in Rock of Ages but I'm crying because I'm so terrified that I'm going to step out there and I don't know 
any of my lines or it was like such a surreal kind of I'll call it the yips uh and uh, Adam Danheiser took me out like we're like, I'm about to go on stage I got the mic I got the you know the the dad costume on and everything and he takes me out on the street and opens the stage door <laughs> and he said see those cars see the cabs see the people walking down the street that's real life we're just doing a silly play it's all gonna be okay <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I went in and I walked on stage and I started singing and it was fine, but it was that, like, it's that was a really, uh, apparently now I'm very being very vulnerable with, with sharing the story, <laughs> but it was one of those crazy theater moments. I had heard Dennis O'Hare had a moment like that at one point during um, Take Me Out, I think. It's like, it's that thing of like the repetition of it um, becomes. Uh, you know, there are those days where you're singing a song and you're like, oh my God, what time is my kid's school conference tomorrow? And that <laughs> happens in your brain. And that's when it gets really scary because you, you, you get so accustomed to doing it. And I'll, I'll just never forget Adam opening the stage door and pointing to the taxis. Like I was like a five-year-old, which I really needed. And that was- And then awesome. a year later, I had the worst breakdown of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I got the yips so bad, I didn't come up for air for months. <laughs> Well, I feel like I I feel like I need to go take a Xanax now just to like <laughs> calm my own nerves down. Uh, Chris, I'm going to ask you the same question. Over the course of 12 years, is there one memory in general that stands out as a favorite from this show? I mean, I mean, there are a zillion. The one that popped in my head because it kind of was, it, it it was it was not while we were doing. It wasn't during the actual show show, but we were we were rehearsing at New 42 before. Uh, we went on on Broadway and we were on one floor above us was Jeffrey Rush rehearsing Exit the King and below us was Dolly Parton in nine to five and we would all be taking the elevators every day and there were many days where I'm just this like LA like nobody like like kid you know no one knew who I was just a nobody just wrote this silly show that people were convinced would be closed in a week and I'm riding this elevator and there's Jeffrey Rush and there's Dolly Parton and all these Broadway people and it was incredibly intimidating uh, but I just kind of soldiered and we did our work and stuff like that and um, and then like you know it, during that time of, of putting the show up I just kind of had this feeling like I want to embrace every romantic thing about Broadway while I'm while I'm doing this because who knows if this will ever happen again so I was just like and so like one night at, it was like, but it was like in previews. Um, I went to Bar Centrale because that's you know a very cool thing to do when you're putting on a show. And I walked in, and Jeffrey Rush was at a table drinking, and I just remember him looking up and seeing me, and just kind of nodding at me. And it was one of those like kind of moments where you're like, oh, I'm. I'm in. I'm, I'm in. At least for now, I'm in. <laughs> I ha I have arrived. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it was just a little like it kind of put me at ease. Like, like, oh man, this is a community, and this is one of my favorite actors, and he recognized me in the elevator with him going to work, and we're all working, and it was really cool. I love that story. That's amazing. I want to plug it again before I let you all, all three of you go, because I know you have busy schedules. April 24th on Stellar at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Want to check out where it's playing in your local hub. Please check the website, Stellar. Um, I promise you all will not be disappointed with this all-star reunion concert. It's going to be a blast. I cannot wait to watch it. Adam, James, Chris, thank you so much for joining me with iHeartRadio Broadway today. Thank you so much. Rock on. Thank you iHeartRadio Broadway, driven by Mercedes-Benz, the best for nothing.